Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 17 of my beta campaign. What we see coming off the pad here is a second habitat module for the Hipparchus Space Station. And this particular craft uh, forced me to upgrade my launch pad. So my launch pad is now a tier 3 launch pad. And it wasn't the mass of the thing that actually forced it, though it is tipping the scales at almost 124 tons. It was the height of the thing. The old launch pad couldn't take the how tall this particular ship was. So, yeah, so now I got a second building up to tier 3. It joins the, um, what was the other building I did? Oh, it was the administrative building. Yes, that, that, that is tier 3 as well. But this isn't going to be the main event for this particular uh, episode. Main event is going to be coming up later, which is going to be a single vessel putting up three keel stationary satellites, and we'll talk about what is the best way of accomplishing that particular task. So for now, let's get back to this particular mission. So as I mentioned, this is bringing up a second habitat module up to the Parkus station. The actual contract is one of the historical contracts that come from the Mission Controller 2 mod. The It is the Skylab contract, which forced me to make this a hitchhiker can. I would love to have actually made this a, uh, a science lab. One of those science processing labs would be an appropriate thing to attach to it. But another hitchhiker can's all right. It'll give our Kerbinauts up there a little bit more elbow room. But the thing that's making this so big, so massive, is that I've also added on some extra fuel. And the reason for that is that I have some work in mind for my Kerbinauts up there. I think they're getting a little bit too lazy just floating around with nothing to do. So I got to give them some jobs. Um, and you can see that there's actually two uh, parts to this, two modules. There's the, there's the um, hitchhiker can with some fuel attached to it in the lower part, but on the upper part you'll see a second fuel can hooked on with some docking ports, and I will ex you'll see what that's about in just a little bit. So we do our rendezvous the way we normally would do, but uh, as we are approaching this particular station. The thing to notice here is that uh, I have no RCS on this vehicle whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is just um, bring it and kind of park it in, in, not quite alongside, but nearby. I don't want to, it's going to be drifting there for a bit. And I don't want to end up accidentally drifting into the station. Um, and then it's going to be the job of our crew to take the Kuryus out and uh, put these modules where they need to be. And you can see that we got Tom Plock and Bill in the Curious. I thought I'd leave Rodbart in the station, sort of the mind the store. And, uh, you know, last episode we did a lot of docking. So what I thought might be kind of fun is to do this whole thing from the cockpit view. So we're looking out the window here. I also have a camera set up with uh, that's pointing out towards the front, right beside the docking port. And I'll use this opportunity as well to talk about the numbers along the, uh, the docking alignment indicator, those three numbers towards the bottom. The DST is the straight line distance between the two docking ports. Then there's the CDST, which is just the sort of perpendicular distance, how far you are forward of the docking port. So right now I'm at 11.8, 11.7. That's how far I have to come forward uh, to get the docking ports. You can see those two numbers are getting closer and closer together as the uh, docking ports become closer and closer to being aligned. And then finally, the bottom number is my just my vertical speed towards the docking ports. How far am I going vertically? And the uh, also talk about the cross, the green cross. That green cross uh, is green because I am in front of the docking port. And if you are behind the docking port and you need to go backwards, then that thing turns red. You'll see that later. But anyway, we're kind of closing in on the distance. Uh, what do we got here at five and a half meters from the docking port? Five meters, four and a half meters. And of course, um, once you get into the last couple of meters, the magnetic forces take over and just kind of suck the two things together. So it goes very quick at that part. Uh, three meters. I could probably go a little bit faster. I mean, 0 0.07 meters per second, really. I don't think I need to be that cautious. Thank goodness this is at two times speed. And there we are. 
Now, as the Curuse is the only thing that has any reaction wheels or RCS on it at all, I'm not going to take the whole thing over in one go. I'm going to take the two modules separately. So the first part to go is this external tank. And the idea with this external tank is actually to just mount it on the Curuse exactly the way you see it here. And this is going to extend the range of the Curuse, give it some fuel so it can get to some places and do some work for me. And I put these uh, lights at the front of it, just, I don't know, give it give it some style, I suppose, that it can, as it's approaching an object, it can, it can light it up as it approaches. And as you can uh, see here, these lights, well, I don't think they're really supposed to be as powerful as this. And although Kerbal Engineer seems to be confused by the way I have this set up, and it's not showing that I have any delta V whatsoever. Actually, with this external tank, the Curuse has a, has a delta V of around 1,200 meters per second, which, uh, which will allow it to, to get some places. And my eventual goal is actually to use this thing to uh, deorbit uh, some of my junkier satellites so I can try and clear up my skies a little bit. Um, anyway, I'm just going to put this and attach it uh, to a docking port on the space station and it's time to go back and get that second module. Now one of the things that seems to have come up with the uh, beta version of KSP is that if you have an unmanned probe and if that even if that probe is capable of using SAS as soon as um, that vessel is no longer the focus the SAS seems to turn off and that vessel starts to tumble. It's come up a couple of times in this series. And um, one of the things I was doing in my docking episode uh, last time was using the Remote Tech flight computer to kind of lock the target vessel onto a vector so that it wouldn't tumble. But, uh, you know, that's not a stock thing to do. So this, this is a stock trick, and it, it's a bit of a cheat, it feels like, but to me, it's not fair that it doesn't seem right that the, the vessel can't lock onto a target when you are not having it as the focus vessel. So what I do here is I just use time warp to stop the rotation. This is just a, a little trick. You time warp all the rotating stops. And then when you come out of time warp, everything is locked in the position that it was. So now my target vehicle, which is the space station, is no longer rotating and I can go and dock with it without having to worry about docking with something that's spinning around. Now as I got closer to the space station, I suddenly realized that I had selected the wrong docking port. I don't want to be uh, docking with the docking port I have selected right now. I want to be at the one that's at the other end of the space station. Now, one of the ways I can make this a lot simpler on myself is to name those docking ports. I really got to start doing that. You can right click on a docking port and give it a name and then you can use the forward and back buttons that are at the bottom of the docking alignment indicator to select your docking port uh, that way rather than having to right click and select the docking part. It makes things much much simpler when you have more complicated uh, vessels with multiple docking ports on them. And notice how that the green crosshair went red as soon as I uh, sw switched to the other docking port. That's because I am on the wrong side of that docking port. So that's telling me I need to go backwards a bit as well as of course I have to flip my orientation of my spacecraft 180 degrees. Um, the other thing I'm going to be paying attention to this time around is the uh, rotation um, because uh, this is going to be the second module of the space station. It's going to basically stick on it the way it is and I want those solar panels to be lined up. Um, and so one of the things we can use now is that rotation tool that's down there at the bottom. You can see that I have it turned to 180 degrees uh, straight down. Uh, I also want to get the doors of the two um, hitchhiker cans to be, the hatches to be on the same side. So this allows me to do the rotating part um, a lot easier. Now, to be honest, with this one, because of the solar panels, actually, you can use the solar panels to, to get your alignment right as well. But uh, not all parts are going to have solar panels on them, so the, that rotation indicator sure is handy. And with the final module in place, our space station is almost done for now. I, I still plan on adding on to this soon, but uh, I want to stiffen up this joint here. The thing with the docking ports is docking ports are always a little bit flimsy. So we're going to have Bill going out there. He's going to stiffen this up so that it's not quite so wobbly. And we're going to do this using 
Kerbal Attachment System, or KAS, a mod that I have installed that, among other things, allow you to add on struts in space. So we have these strut endpoints already attached to the module we just added, and all Bill has to do is decide upon some good places to put them. So he grabs um, one of the strut endpoints, decides upon a location, attaches it, links to it, grabs the other endpoint, puts it on the other side of the docking ports, and links those together. And then this strut um, will stiffen this joint up so I can change the attitude of the spacecraft without getting nearly as much wobbling going on. And all Bill has to do now is to place three more of these things to get this thing relatively stiff. And uh, what's nice is I can take this apart again so that if I want to attach other parts in there in the future, I can do that. But for now, uh, this space station is going to be the way it is for a little bit. And now we join Jeb once again in the air. Stark is once again measuring, I don't know, pressure or temperature or something. I can't remember. And you know what? Absolutely nothing of interest uh, happens in this mission whatsoever. Everything goes fine. Uh, all, everything is gathered the way we go. We finish off the contract and you know what? We're just going to skip right on past it. We're going to go to the main event, which is going to be the launching of our three Keo stationary satellites. So, housed beneath this fairing is not one, not two, but three satellites. And the plan is to place these three satellites equally spaced in Keo stationary orbits. Now, just in case there are some of you out there that don't know what I mean by geostationary, I suppose I should offer some words of explanation. We know that as your orbit, the altitude of your orbit gets higher, the period of your orbit, the amount of time to complete one orbit, gets longer. And there comes a point where the period of the orbit, the amount of time it takes the satellite to go around, exactly matches the rotation of the planet. When we have that around the Earth, we call that a geostationary orbit. So in a geostationary orbit, the period of the orbit is exactly, well, it's actually a little less than 24, we won't get into that, but let's call it 24 hours, though the Earth doesn't exactly rotate in 24 hours, but let's not go there. Um, and so if you place a satellite in that orbit with that period and you make it an equatorial orbit, then that satellite will remain over the exact same location on the surface of the planet. And this is really useful for communication satellites. So for instance, if you have something like satellite television or satellite internet where you have a dish attached to your home, the thing you must notice is that you don't have to move that dish around. It gets pointed once at the satellite that it's receiving the signal from and that's it and that's because that satellite is stationary relative to you it is in a geostationary orbit so for geostationary orbits we want to do the same thing around Kerbin now the period of Kerbin of rotation is exactly six hours so what we want to do is place a satellite in an orbit that has a period of six hours and the altitude that works out to have a period of exactly six hours is 2,868.75 kilometers. So what we want to do is to place our satellite into as close a circular orbit as we can get where the mean altitude or what we often call the semi-major axis of our orbit is 2,868.75 kilometers. Now, uh, what would be extra nice is if we can place our first satellite so that it is exactly, or as close as we can get to being, over the Kerbal Space Center. So here's how we're going to do this. Number one is I'm going to put in a maneuver node, and I'm not actually putting this maneuver node in to use it. What I'm doing is I'm just setting the apoapsis of the maneuver node out to the altitude that I want so that I can work out that, uh, you know, looking at the time it takes to get to apoapsis and looking at the time to the maneuver node, I can see that from burn to apoapsis is going to take about one hour and 23 minutes. Now, Kerbin rotates at 6 hours, so if you take 1 hour and 23 minutes, divide it by 6, and multiply by 360, you can figure out that Kerbin will rotate 83 degrees during that time period, during the time it takes you to get out there. Now, I'm going to use MapSat to help me determine what the longitude is of the Kerbal Space Center. You can also actually look this up online, I'm sure you could find out. And the longitude of the Kerbal Space Center is about 76 degrees 
west. But remember that the Kerbal Space Center is going to move through 83 degrees while it goes out there. So I want to get my apoapsis to be 83 degrees ahead of that. So I add 83 degrees to 76 degrees west and that gets me 7 degrees east. That's where I want my apoapsis to be when I burn. But, of course, I don't burn at apoapsis. I'm going to burn at periapsis. So I have to burn at 180 degrees to that. So I add 180 degrees to the 7 degrees east. That gets me 187 degrees east. That is the longitude at which I want to do my burn. If I burn there, then by the time I get up to apoapsis, I should have the, KSC, the Kerbal Space Center right below me. And if you got lost in all of that, don't feel so bad. I always have to draw this out on a piece of paper in order to figure it out every single time that I do it. So if you need to, just draw it out, and it hopefully should make some sense. So anyway, I can use Kerbal Engineer to give me my longitude, and then that allows me to decide when to burn. So I burn just like a degree or so ahead of uh, the longitude that I was targeting at, which is that 187 degrees east. Um, to be honest, this burn took a little longer than I thought it was going to, so I probably should have burned a few degrees ahead of that still, but uh, it, it comes out to be okay anyway. And all we have to do now is to keep burning until our apoapsis gets up to around 2,868 kilometers. Truth be told, this is probably overkill. Um, I don't really need to put a satellite over the KSC and have it locked there, and neither do I need the whole Keo stationary thing for that matter. The main purpose of these satellites is actually just to provide communication links to my interplanetary probes that are on the way out to Duna and to Moho. And all I needed for that was really just two satellites. I could have put them in any orbit that I want as long as they were on opposite sides of the planet so that if one of the satellites was uh, blocked by Kerbin in its attempt to communicate then the um, the other one could take over, but I don't know. I always figure if you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. So the whole Keo stationary thing is something I kind of want to do anyway. Here we are about five minutes from apoapsis. So we're getting close to the time where we can drop our first satellite, but there's something we need to accomplish first. We want these three satellites to be equally spaced in orbits that each have a period of six hours. So we have three satellites, so if you take the six hours divided by three, that's two hours. So we want these satellites to be two hours apart. The way we're going to accomplish that is to give the transfer vehicle a period such that each time it comes up to apoapsis, um, it will be ready to drop another satellite and that satellite will be in the correct position. Now a period of two hours would work, but unfortunately that's not possible. You can see our period is actually already well over two hours, and a period of two hours with an apoapsis out here will put the periapsis below the curve and surface. So obviously that doesn't work, so what we do is we go to four hours. Four hours works just as well, and each time we come back up here four hours later, we will be two hours from the previous satellite that we dropped. We drop another satellite, and after doing that three times, the satellites will all be equally spaced. Now, I am five minutes ahead, five minutes or so ahead of apoapsis, so, and the reason for that is just to give me some time to muck about and get the, the satellite ready to drop. Um, so I'm actually, I want to burn in such a way that I don't push that apoapsis up. So that's why you can see I'm burning also a little bit below the prograde vector. So I'm not only watching my period, I'm also watching my apoapsis, keeping it around that 2,686 kilometers. And then once I get my period at four hours, well, then I am ready to start dropping satellites. Sorry, that would be an apoapsis of 2,868 kilometers or so. But anyway, now we come to my favorite part. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, I love that. that so th this is Infernal Robotics uh, once again. Uh, I, I, I never get tired of kind of looking at this kind of stuff. And, uh, and it's practical as well. It's not just for looks because, you know, it allowed me to pack those satellites in there nice and tightly. And now that I'm ready to deploy them, I can, I can start getting them out there. So I'm going to pick a satellite to deploy. And we're going to uh, deploy the solar panels, of course, first. Now, I do want to make sure that this thing comes out not dead. So I want to... Um, raise its 
communitron antenna too so that it can communicate with the transfer vehicle once it's out there. Now this satellite's going to be uh, burning prograde once it is released from the transfer vehicle. So what I want to do is I want to start off by pointing at prograde. So I, I select the, the, the control from the satellite and then I select the prograde vector on flight engineer and I, 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 don't, I really don't know what's going on here. Flight engineer uh, seems to be a little bit confused. So we're going to abandon flight engineer for this and we're going to just have to do this manually. Now once I release this satellite, I'm going to have to burn prograde in order to circularize its orbit. So that's why I have it oriented this way, so I don't have to worry about it crashing back into the transfer vehicle. So it comes time to release it, and then we got to play a little bit with the directional antennas. We're going to take one of the antennas, we're going to point it at mission control, so that this satellite will forever remain in contact with mission control. And then we're going to take the other dish and we're going to point it back at the transfer vehicle and then we're going to take the transfer vehicle and we're going to point its dish back to this uh, satellite so that way um, the transfer vehicle and this satellite will always remain in contact so when the time the transfer vehicle comes back up to its apoapsis it'll have a communication link with this communication satellite which remember is going to be permanently located over the Kerbal Space Center so that uh, I won't have to worry about uh, losing that communication link. And then all we have to do is circularize this orbit and get its period as close to six hours as we can make it. And finally, we're going to uh, deploy this larger dish antenna and this is going to be the antenna we're going to be using to communicate with our interplanetary probes. And this one I'm going to point to the Ptolemy spacecraft, which, if you recall, is on its way to Duna. We then just ride our transfer vehicle around, and four hours later we come back to Apoapsis, and we repeat this process again with our second satellite. Except this time what we're going to do with the... Uh, with the directional antennas is we're going to take one of these smaller directional antennas and we're going to point it at our first uh, communications satellite. We're going to take the, then the dish antenna from the first satellite and point it at the second one so that these two will now be in permanent contact. And then back at our second geostationary satellite we'll take that second dish antenna and we'll point it back at the transfer vehicle so that way the transfer vehicle will still remain in communication. Um, another thing you might do is um, put a third of these smaller directional antennas on here and just point it at Kerbin. Um, if you have all three uh, geostationary satellites all pointing towards Kerbin you actually get complete um, low Kerbin orbit communication coverage that way as well. But remember, I still have my first generation communication satellites that are, that are up there that I put uh, up there quite some time ago. And there are, uh, so I already have low Kerbin orbit all covered, so I don't have to do that. But that's something you could do as well, rather than having these two generations. You can just go straight to these um, geostationary ones or geostationary ones and use directional antennas to cover Kerbin as low orbit Kerbin as well and if you want to you can put more on there and you can cover the moon and Minmus too. And finally we'll take uh, the large dish and we'll point that towards Aldin Altusi which as you recall is on its way to Moho. But before we get to placing our final satellite I noticed that ComSat 1 was getting very close to being in Ptolemy's uh, communication cone from its dish antenna. So I just time warped out to that, and that allowed me to go out to Ptolemy, and yes, it's alive, it's alive. And now one of the issues that happened with Ptolemy, as you can see here, is that I no longer have my encounter with Duna. So my first job would be to fix that. Now that happened while I was time warping. You got to be a little bit careful when you time warp and you have these vessels, especially on long journeys, uh, journeys that are not really orbits, but are these hyperbolic trajectories that are going from one sphere of influence into another. You can often have them sort of uh, change on you unexpectedly. And uh, that's, I think, I'm pretty sure is a floating decimal error that, uh, that the squad probably can't do anything about. So my advice always if you are doing a lot of time warping and you have 
vessels that are on these long trajectories, even if they're just going to Minmus. I've seen orbits to Minmus change as well. My advice would be to always be either in the tracking station or to select the vessels directly and time warp there. Don't time warp from the KSC view where you can't keep track of what's going on. Now as we're using the Motec flight computer to execute our burn. I want to take a quick look here at the top left and take a look at the signal delay. The signal delay for this ship is now up to 2.6 seconds. There's a 2.6 second delay between when I put in a command and when that command gets executed. And that delay is only going to increase and now you know why this flight computer becomes necessary. As that delay becomes longer and longer and longer, being able to execute these maneuvers becomes only an exercise in frustration if you're going to do them manually. And finally, you know, being out of Kerbin Sphere of Influence, we are actually in a high solar orbit, so that gives us a new biome from which to collect some science. Now, there's only two instruments on here that can collect science from high orbit. They are the uh, magnetometer and the uh, orbital scanner thingy that comes with the Mission Controller 2 mod. So, we might as well get the science that we can out of those. And finally, our transfer vehicle is back at Apoapsis for the third time, ready to release its last satellite. And you know the drill here. I don't, I don't need to go over this too much. We release the satellite. We play around with the communication antennas. We're also going to deorbit this transfer vehicle. There's enough um, fuel left in there for us to get it out of our skies. And we finally have it set up so that the first communication satellite is in communication with uh, mission control and relaying the signal to the second satellite which relays the signal over to the third satellite so that all of these satellites are in communication with each other independently of any other satellites and I can use them now to communicate with any probes that I may have in the inner part of our solar system that is out to Duna. So anything from Duna's orbit inwards is fine. Drez, Joule, and Elo are still out of reach communication wise. We're gonna have to get some bigger antennas before we can go there. But that's going to end it for this episode and we will hopefully see you next time.